and don't even realize they've just been insulted. But uh, this is one, <coughs> one of my favorite places, and the Petersons are some of my favorite people, and I appreciate more than I could ever articulate the friendship that I share, the fellowship uh, that uh, I uh, share with the Petersons and this church family. You know, you may not think that you're all that important, but I've been preaching here now long enough to walk in, and if you were missing, I would miss you because I've been preaching here that long. And so I appreciate how faithful you've been to the meeting. Many of you have not missed a single service. Some of you only one service, and I commend you for that. And I appreciate all the special music tonight. Uh, the rectors, what a blessing they were. And uh, Zeke, I believe, got your dad with you, if I'm not mistaken, all the way from Morley, the metropolis of Morley. <laughs> Everybody knows where Morley is. Thank you, uh, for the rector, for coming, being in the service. And I appreciate how good you've been to me these days. Comfortable motel room, delicious meals, warm times of fellowship, every act of kindness. Now, if you worked the nursery this week, if you played uh, an instrument this week, uh, if you uh, cleaned the building this week, you do know that uh, after we have left each and every night, someone has come in behind us to uh, prep the building, prepare the building for the next service. And so uh, if you've done those things, passed out a flyer, invited someone, uh, worked, uh, worked the sound, worked uh, the uh, video camera, well, thank you, because you played a great part, right. I believe, in the Indeed. success of this meeting. That's right. And uh, you may not have had your name on the banner, your picture on the banner, your name on the flyer, your picture on the flyer, but you're what I call servants in the shadows, Indeed. and it played a great part in the success of this meeting. Right. Second Samuel chapter 23, I'll be forever grateful for that day when God allowed my path to cross with Brother Pete Peterson, Mrs. Peterson, and I'll tell you what, we love the Peterson family. In fact, I'd go so far to say, if you don't like the Petersons, I don't like you. You should get an amen right there. Let's try that again. If you don't like the Petersons, I don't like you. I sure do love these folks. And they're such a blessing to Mrs. Hamble and I. And thank you, Brother Peterson, for the honor to be here in the Vineyard Pulpit these days. Second Samuel chapter 23, and I'll take but one verse of scripture for our text, and it will be verse number 10. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the word of God. Second Samuel chapter 23 and verse number 10. Uh, Brother Rector Sr., a um, couple uh, weeks ago, uh, well, last month, but a couple of weeks ago, really, I, I marked my uh, 44th anniversary, my 44th year of being saved and preaching and on the revival road. Just really a handful of days ago, last month, September 30th, and uh, there's a church that I preach in every year around my anniversary. They want me to come, Brother Randy, at that time, and I have for, man, decades and uh, every year, every year, they, they buy me a wristwatch every single year. And uh, the, the wristwatch they got me the year before I had me wore out. But they just get me one every year. And uh, they got me one this year. I'm wearing it tonight, and it has, a, it has a chronograph on it. Who knows what a chronograph is? Two people, three people. A chronograph marks time. What a chronograph is. It marks time. And it's amazing. I've been using it now for a couple days, and I've only been preaching 22 minutes. Maybe it's 122 minutes. I'm not, I might be reading it wrong. Second Samuel. Oh, that's funnier you're letting on. Second Samuel <laughs> chapter 23 and verse number 10. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave under the sword. And the Lord won a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. There's a phrase in this verse that I have underlined in my Bible, <coughs> underlined in my Bible, and you may want to underscore in yours, and it's the phrase, 
in his hand clave unto the sword. Do you see? There it is, and his hand clave unto the sword. When we started our fall revival meeting on Sunday, I spoke to you on the subject, playing games at Golgotha. Sunday night, my prayer for a prodigal nation. Monday night, the right side isn't the left side. And the left side isn't the right side. And if you're in the service last night, Tuesday night, you know that I spoke on the subject, what do you do when you don't hear from God? But focusing our heart's attention upon that phrase and his hand clave under the sword for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject tonight, why I refuse to release my sword any time soon. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the word of God. If in my heart, <clears throat> I want to be a blessing, but the only way that I can pay is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place that hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh, warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. Lord, I request, oh, how I would request that you clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated today. A person uh, can there turn and tune their ear to any number of spiritual skirmishes, skirmishes and hear the disheartening sound uh, of the believer's single most important spiritual weapon being dropped in the dirt. The corresponding characteristic of every defeated army is not piles of damaged swords, uh, but piles of discarded swords. A deserted weapon never belongs to a dedicated warrior. Why I refuse to release my sword any time soon. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 23, we find King David's uh, declaration of his mighty man from his deathbed. Now place a mental bookmarker there and allow me to say that I believe Brother Peterson it would make an excellent, uh, uh, just uh, outstanding series of sermons for a preacher to just work and weave his way through the word of God, preaching on all the famous or familiar deathbed scenes in the scriptures. In that series, no doubt, would be the deathbed scene, the deathbed scenario that we find here in 2 Samuel 23. This chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. The Song of David. Verses 1 through 7, and then the soldiers of David, verses 8 through 39. It is well, the unknown writer is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the soldiers of David that an individual reads, oh my, 
a heart gripping seven word phrase about the mighty man Eliezer. Verse 10, and his hand clave unto the sword. G. Campbell Morgan, that great Bible student and Bible preacher, once penned about our text. It is interesting to remember that these men that had gathered to, to him in Adullam, 1 Samuel 22, 2, who had been described as men in debt, in danger, and discontented. And then F.B. Meyer, or G. Campbell Morgan, I should say, E. Campbell Morgan ties up his thought by writing, they are possessed of natural powers which had been spoiled, but now were redeemed and realized. This was the very same scripture that C.I. Schofield selected to preach from for the funeral service of the great evangelist D.L. Moody on December 26, 1899. The word clay, and I want you to note it, I want you to underline it, I want you to star it, I want you to circle it in our text. The word clay in the Hebrew language means to cling or to adhere. A person must keep in the forefront of their thinking that Eliezer, which means God is helper, sword is a type of every believer's scripture and service. Someone says, all right, Dr. Hamlin, I know that it's a type of scripture, but would you say scripture and service? Oh, yes, because what good would scripture be without service? And what good would service be without scripture? Amen. So it is a dual type. It is a dual picture. Good. It is a dual representation. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Never forget if Eliezer rejected even the thought of dropping his sword in that day, then the believer should reject the thought of dropping their sword in this dispensation. Now, if you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating, if Eliezer, if Eliezer, if Eliezer rejected even the thought of dropping his sword in that day, then the believer, that's me, and that's you, if you're saved, should reject the thought of dropping our sword in this dispensation. Friend, you and I, those of us that are saved and serving, need to understand the motives why we must not let loose of our sword. Okay. Now, would you look at the phrase, in his hand clay under the sword? Would you look at the phrase, and his hand clay under the sword? Would you look at the phrase, and his hand clay under the sword? Quickly tonight, there are three reasons why I reject dropping my weapon of spiritual warfare in this day and hour. And they're all found here in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Let's quickly notice it tonight. Why I refuse to release my sword anytime soon. Number one, the brethren behind me. Amen. Verse 9, and after him <coughs> was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Aoite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defiled the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. A reason why I reject dropping my sword in the not so distant future is because of the brethren behind me. In verse 9, the unknown writer tells us that there comes a point in this uh, uh, poetical battle against the Philistines that the soldiers of Israel choose a military maneuver that is not prized in any manual of warfare and that is they pull back in pitiful retreat from one significant moment detachments horses chariots spears bows arrows and swords 
turn from the enemy and head in the opposite direction towards safety and sadly disgrace. The courageous command, charge, becomes the cowardly call, retreat. A person can see in the theater of their mind, and let me interject, that's the only time that a Christian should ever go to the theater is in their mind. You say, oh, I'm not handling what's wrong with going to the theater. You may want to ask Abraham Lincoln that question, but a person can see in the theater of their mind that while the brigade is running from the fray and the angel is passing them in a blur, running to the fray, but the fog of war is as thick as pea soup. He is swinging his sword and singing. See the mighty host advancing, Satan leading on, mighty men around us falling, courage almost gone. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb, and shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? And a call for royal soldiers comes to one and all, a soldiers for the conflict. Will you heed the call? Will you answer quickly with a ready cheer? Will you be enlisted as a volunteer? News flash those leaving the battle become the fuel for one of David's mighty men to linger, oh my, and last in the very same uh, battle. Friend, you and I need to understand that the reason why I reject dropping uh, my weapon of spiritual warfare in this day and hour is the brethren behind me. Yes. The Bible says in Nehemiah 4, uh, 14, remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Right. Amen. Can I go ahead and preach tonight? Amen. It's a Sunday school bus that has recently lost a driver. The rescue mission that has just lost a young preacher. The Sunday school class that has lately lost a teacher. And even the pulpit that has newly lost a, a pastor that must inspire, oh my, that must inspire, that must inspire the soldier of the cross to press on. Right. Or a reason why I refuse to release my sword anytime soon is the brethren behind me. Good, good. During World War II, a B-17, Brother Rector, the Tonde Leo, <coughs> was barraged by flak from Nazi anti-aircraft guns during its bombing run over the city of German city of Castillo. And that was not unusual, the fight from the enemy, but that the gas tank was hit by 11, oh my, 20 millimeter unexploded shells that pierced the fuel tank without touching off an explosion. Just one shell that hit the fuel tank would be more, Brother Randy, uh, than sufficient to blow a B-17 out of the sky. After the crew chief gathered the shells, they were sent to the armors to be diffused and then on to the United States Intelligence Unit. Apparently, Brother Peterson, when the armors opened each of those shells, they found no explosive charge. They were as clean as a whistle and just as harmless. Empty, not all of them, one contained a carefully rolled piece of paper. On it was a scroll in check. After being closely translated, the note read, this is all we can do for you now. Hey, child of God, because of those that are spiritually A-W-O-L, we must determine not to drop our sword for the checks of World War II were so right insane this is all we can do for you now. Or oh, a reason why I refuse to release my sword anytime soon is the brethren behind me. Good. Remember, Timothy Hayes and I know when he gets stuck here, the battle beside me. 
Look at it, verse 10. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. The reason why I reject dropping my sword in the not so distant future is because of the battle beside me. In verse 10, the unknown writer tells us that the clash is so close for the Peterson that bows, oh my, and arrows uh, would be totally ineffective in hand to hand combat. The fact that Eliezer was killing the enemy with his sword shows he is not back at headquarters reading a comic book uh, and drinking a strawberry milkshake, yep. but he is knee deep and severed Philistine appendages and far behind enemy lines. Right. Mm -hmm. Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, it strikes me that conflict is the principal feature of the Christian life this side of heaven. Friend, you and I, I need to understand the reason why I reject uh, dropping my weapon of spiritual warfare in this day and hour is the battle beside me. Good. Let me just say in, part, uh, in passing, let me just say in passing that if you're saved, if your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, if your sins have been forgiven, you don't have to look for the fight. The fight will look for you. Right. I think there's sometimes people who just think, well, I, I got I to find a fight to join. No, 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 no. You don't have to have a fight. You don't have to join a fight. A fight's going to join you. And you don't have to look for it. You don't have to ask for it. Oh, this bird you're letting on. Uh, you don't have to uh, uh, send out a personal invitation for it. No, sir, no, ma'am. Listen, if you're saved, like it, lump it, bump it, jump it, yeah. take it across the street and dump it. If you're saved, you don't have to look for the fight. The fight will look for you. Right. And now, there's several foes that are on the spiritual battleground today. And it may shock you, stun you, and even surprise you, but first of all, apostasy. Jude 3, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. A foe uh, that's on the spiritual battleground of today is apostasy. The offers of weak, uh, watered down, uh, wimpy, so-called Christianity must be opposed on every side and at every turn. God deliver us from those that won't take a stand. God deliver us from those that have this uh, go along uh, to get along attitude. You see, uh, it is what we believe that is the basis uh, of our getting along. Uh, it's what we believe uh, that is the bedrock of our getting along. We just don't get along to go perish the thought. We just don't get along to go along. No, sir, no, ma'am. It's what we believe that is, again, our bedrock. Uh, it is our basis. Uh, and a foe uh, that's on the battleground of today is apostasy. Secondly, anarchy. Second Timothy 3, 1, this know also that in the last days, Perilous times shall come. And you see a foe that's on the battleground of today is anarchy. Uh, the way to get crime off of the streets uh, is to get Christ into the drug dealer's heart, the murderer's heart, right. the robber's heart, yep. and the woman of soiled reputation's heart. Can I go ahead and preach? Yep. I don't want to hear you say one negative word about crime in the Hastings or crime uh, in uh, Grand Rapids or crime in wherever when you haven't passed out a gospel track because the answer to crime still is Christ. Uh, and a foe that's on the spiritual battleground of today is anarchy. Good. Thirdly, apathy. Luke twenty-two forty-five, And when he arose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. You see a foe that's on 
uh, the spiritual battleground of today uh, is uh, uh, apathy, indifference uh, is the enemy sniper that has taken down more Christians and more churches than any other antagonist. Think about this tonight. Apathy has never won a soul to Christ. That's right. That's right. Apathy has never brought a first time visitor. Apathy has never built a bus route. Right. Apathy has never gone to the mission field. Apathy has never held a revival meeting. Apathy is a foe uh, on the spiritual battleground of today. Right. Oh, listen, this so-called, uh, what I call uh, uh, Brother uh, Peterson flip-flop sandal Christianity uh, that individuals have that have invaded our churches. It screams casual and it suddenly comes off uh, right in the midst of a spiritual combat. Hey, friend, we ought to get serious. We ought to get serious. We ought to get serious about this matter of serving the Lord and ought to shake ourselves and say, God, don't let me get apathetic. God, don't let me go through the motions. God, don't let me play church. Right. Apathy. Oh, that every believer that was in this service would realize the foes that are on the spiritual battle ground of today are apostasy and anarchy and apathy. Right. right. Pearl Harbor, the morning of December 7th, 1941, found 353 Japanese airplanes swarming all over the harbor site. Brother Zeke, within a couple of hours, American losses of eight big battleships, six major airfields, almost all planes, and 2,400 men. That happened at 7.50 in what was supposedly a surprise attack. But here are, Brother Randy, the startling facts. <laughs> that morning at 7 a.m., while the Japanese warplanes were 100 and 37 miles, 50 minutes away, two U.S. soldiers on a small radar station in the Pacific scanned the screen and saw dots and dots appearing until the whole screen was filled. These youthful soldiers notified their young supervisor, a lieutenant. No other officer was around that being Sunday. The lieutenant thought that these must be planes from California and without another thought, said these crucial words, don't worry about it. Mm. Wow. There would have been time to scramble uh, the planes at Pearl Harbor, prepare the battleships, and shelter the men. But this lieutenant, at the most responsible moment of his career, failed the nation. Hey, Christian, it was a don't worry about it attitude that cost us battleships airfields, planes, and men at Pearl Harbor, and that same attitude will cost us churches and bus routes, men, women, boys, and girls in our fundamental churches. Hey, a reason why that I refuse to release my sword anytime soon is the battle beside me. Sometimes I hear preachers even say, well, why do we always have to why do we all have to fight? Why do we always have to war? Why do we always have to? Why do we always have to battle? Now, if you're asking a question like that, you need to just get out of the ministry. Right. So, oh, don't read, well, I wouldn't say that if I were you. I, I know you wouldn't say it. That's why God had me say it, because you wouldn't say it. <laughs> I like what I heard Dr. Jack Lyle say one time. He said, if I've got courage enough to preach it, you ought to have courage enough to say amen to it when I preach it. Good. Amen. 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 Good. They say things like, why do we always got to fight? And why do we always have to war? And why do we always have to battle? Uh, well, uh, friend, listen, maybe you ought to find out that we're not in the New Jerusalem. Maybe you ought to find out that we're in the low land of sin and sorrow. Maybe you ought
ought to find out that we're still in a fight and we won't be out of that fight uh, until we hear the horn blow or until we go to glory, till we go to heaven. Hey, friend, listen, the reason why I refuse to release my sword anytime soon is the battle beside me. Great. And then number three, last of all, my time is gone. Not only the brethren behind me, it's heartbreaking. I was going to catch a plane with Peterson a number of years ago. The preacher called me and he said, uh, I was at my gate. He said, Dr. Hamlin, I need a phone number. And I believe you have it, a preacher. And I said, I have his number, but I'm not sure. And this this will date me. I'm not sure where I, where I have it in my palm pilot. That, that dates me. How many raise your hand and say you know what a palm pilot is? I had one when we first came out. It was awesome. I loved it. Loved it. And uh, it's kind of like a what we would now compare it to uh, a mini, uh, I guess, uh, a mini <coughs> tablet. And I loved it. I, I enjoyed it. I had a preacher friend that I would preach for, and he would put his, uh, Brother Rector, he put his announcements on his hand, and he'd say, I got a phone pilot too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I used it for many years, and I kind of kind of prided myself in the fact uh, that I've always recorded what I preach and where I preach it, and, and I've had that had that record all these many years. Till one night on a flight, late on a Saturday night, that Paul Pilot asked me a question, Brother Randy, and I answered it wrong and lost a whole decade. Um. Gone. Well, this preacher called me. I'm at the gate waiting to catch my flight. He said, uh, "He said, no, you got this number." He said, uh, "Can I get it from you?" And uh, I said, "Well, I'm not. I'm not sure how I." How I've got that number in my Palm Pilot, but let me start with A, and I'll work. I'll work down till I find it. Just give me a minute, and I'll call you right back. And I went through A, and I, I found a preacher that quit, and then I went through V, and I found three more preachers that quit, and then I went to C, and I found I think it was uh, uh, seven preachers that quit, and then I went to D, and I found another preacher that quit, and, and then I just texted my friend back and said, "You're depressing me. Get that number from somebody else." <laughs> You see, the reason why I refuse to release my sword anytime soon is the brethren behind me. Good, good. I wonder how many people in all these years that Brother and Sister Peterson and the Gospel Life Baptist Church has been in existence, I wonder how many people have quit mm. and have given up and have gone back to the world. Mm. Friend, don't, don't let that discourage you. Right. Cause that to give you determination to hang on to your sword. Good. Amen. To get a tighter grip. To hang on to your sword and say, I refuse to release my sword anytime soon because of the brethren behind me. Good. Good. And to the battle beside me. This is a fight. The preacher called me and he said, Dr. Hamlin, we got you booked for a revival meeting. I said, Yes, sir, looking forward to being with you. He said, Man, he said, I. He said, I've never seen opposition like this from the devil. I've never seen it like this. And I said, be encouraged. The three times you can count on the devil fighting is before a revival meeting, in a revival meeting, and after a revival meeting. Say amen right there. Amen. You are going to have a battle, and I'm going to have a battle. And if I understand anything in this Bible, I understand the fact that if we're living the way we're supposed to live, hey, the, the devil's not going to say amen about how we're living for God. God, right. There's going to be an attack. There's going to be an assault. The battle beside me. And then number three, the last of all. Oh, I've been looking forward to this third point. And I can't wait to get to it. I, and I can't wait to tell you what number three is. I believe when I tell you what number three is, uh, sir, I believe your socks are going to roll up and down your ankles by themselves. Uh, now, I believe when I tell you what number three is, I mean, your Bible case will sit and unzip by itself. When I tell you what number three is, you're going to go, whoop, when I tell you what number three is. Number three, the blessing beyond me. Amen. <laughs> Verse 10. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Verse 10, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him 
only to spoil. Verse 10, I'm stuck. And the Lord brought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Did I mention verse 10? And the Lord brought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. I was having my devotions, Brother Randy's dad, this morning, and in my Bible reading, it, I read verse 10, and the Lord brought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Had lunch with Brother Peterson today, and we ate at a Chinese restaurant. Brother Peterson, just go with it. And we ate at a Chinese <laughs> restaurant, and you can't eat Chinese uh, without getting an egg roll and a fortune cookie. And the fortune cookie said, uh, verse number 10, and the Lord brought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. I was on my way to church tonight, and I saw a billboard in Hastings, verse 10. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to kick in. Yeah. And the Lord brought a great victory that day. Yeah. And there were people returned after him only to spoil. I was on the front row. And uh, Brother and Sister Rector, as you were singing and blessing our hearts, I got a text message and it said, Verse 10, and the Lord brought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. A reason why I reject uh, dropping my sword in the not so distant future is because of the blessing beyond me. Verse 10, the unknown writer <clears throat> tells us that the epic battle finally ends and the clear champion was the one who endured. Good. Good. The Azer stayed with it and at it long enough to see the dust of the engagement to settle the spoils of the struggle at his feet, and above all, smile of God upon his success. Yeah. If a person, Brother Peterson, were only to get one truth from this powerful narrative, it ought to be this fact. Rewards are only reached by those who remain. Winston Churchill one of my favorite humans of history. Of course, outside of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and people and preachers on the pages of the Bible. But man, I love Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill, that great uh, uh, English statesman once said, oh my, we have not journeyed all this way because we're made of sugar Candy. Friend, you and I, I need to understand a reason why I reject dropping my weapon of spiritual warfare in this day and hour is because of the blessing beyond me. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Good. Man, don't, don't, don't drop your sword. Amen. Don't discard your sword. In fact, I'm praying that this message would cause all of us to have a greater grip. Right. Good. right. To have a greater grip. That this message would cause each and every one of us to have a greater grip because of the blessing beyond me. Good. Hey, Christian, it's the next gospel track that might bring a village Sunday to Christ. That's right. It's the next prayer meeting that might bring a Pentecost to the church. It's the next trip to the altar that might bring a prodigal home. It's the next bus route that might bring a Suzanne Wesley uh, to church history. It's the next sermon that might bring an R.G. Lee to the pulpit. And it's the next revival meeting, oh my, that might bring a wayward nation back to God and good. Yeah. good. All that God's people just had Brother Peter said, a baptism of the endurance of Eliezer. Amen. You know what I love about Eliezer? Eliezer didn't have to have a plaque to serve God. Hello? Good. All right. And Eliezer didn't have to have his name in the bulletin to serve God. By the way, having your name on the bulletin is overrated, really. I'm, I'm not being harsh. God knows my heart. Brother Randy's dad, having your name on the church bulletin, listen to me, it is, it is overrated. 
I, I have my name in church bulletins all across America, and I can't tell you the times my name is misspelled. I can't tell you the times, and John is not a hard thing to spell. <laughs> Eliezer didn't, didn't have to have a plaque to stay in the battle. Eliezer didn't have to have his name of the bulletin to have to stay in the battle. Eliezer uh, didn't, didn't have to have a pat on the back. You know, most people, let me, let me just go ahead and say this. Most people don't, don't need a pat on the back as much as they need a swift kick in the sit down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am John Hamlin. I approve of this message. <laughs> <laughs> Eliezer didn't need, he didn't need a pat on the back. El Eliezer didn't need to be begged. Hmm. Hello? Good. Eliezer didn't need to be pampered. Eliezer, Eliezer didn't need whatever it is you need to keep you going. No, Eliezer said, I'm going to hang on to my sword. Good. I'm going to hang on to my sword. I'm going to hang on to my sword. And if I understand uh, this passage perfectly, I believe that uh, in this battle, he was the only one, the only one, the blessing beyond me. It's a big statement, but I believe tonight I stand in this pulpit and enjoy the experience some wonderful blessings simply because, not, not because I'm talented, but maybe because I'm a little bit, Brother Zeke Rector, a little bit tenacious about not letting go of his sword. Good. Talent will only take you so far. Right. But being tenacious will take you all the way. Amen. And it must have been, Brother Randy, that somewhere in Eliezer's life, he decided, I'm going to hang on to my sword in good days. I'm going to hang on to my sword in bad days. I'm going to hang on to my sword in days between good days and bad days. I'm going to hang on to my sword. And now Eliezer gets to reap the rewards of not dropping the sword. Good. Would it be sad to drop your sword? I, I, I don't know if this if this right here is getting smaller or I'm getting fatter. <laughs> don't, please, please don't don't comment on that. <laughs> I used to be able to go in and out of there and not hit. I, I know it's, it's gotten smaller. I know that. <laughs> can, can you can you imagine the blessing that you might miss tomorrow hmm. because you dropped your sword tonight? Right. Could could you imagine? The blessing that you would miss next week because you dropped your sword this week. Could you imagine the, the blessing that, that might be just, I got more room over here, that, that's just, for, you could put a Mack truck on this side. Can you imagine the blessing you might have next month Are you just hanging on to your sword? Good. This month. The brethren behind me. The battle beside me. The blessing beyond me. Last week I was preaching in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the rector uh, on Monday night, Dr. Tommy Trammell came here to preach. <clears throat> Dr. Tommy Trammell is 90 years of age. 90. Dr. Tommy Trammell came to hear me preach. He's a pastor in the Cincinnati area forever. I believe Noah rode on his bus to go to church. <laughs> there forever. He'd been there so long. I mean, he, he, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, he, he, he was in Cincinnati. And he came to the meeting on Monday night to hear me in Cincinnati last week. And he came to the book table. I, I, won't, I don't think I'll ever forget. And he came carrying his Bible. 90 years of age, he's on a cane. And Brother Zeke Rector, he walked up to me and said, Dr. Hamlin, good to see you. Hugged his neck, and I said, Dr. Trammell, always good to see you. And he just he just handed me his Bible. And I said, Dr. Trammell, what is this? He said, it's my Bible. <laughs> I said, okay. What would you like me to do with it? He said, I'd like you to sign it. And my brother, when he said that, Went back in my mind 44 years 
immediately at that book table. And remember when I was 17 years of age, I, Mrs. Hamlin and I went to hear Dr. Tommy Trammell in a revival meeting in Taylor, Michigan. Mm -hmm. I was 17. Mm -hmm. And Brother Peterson, when Dr. Trammell got done preaching, I gave him my Bible mm -hmm. and asked him to sign it. Mm -hmm. And now 44 years later, I get signed his. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder what we've missed. I wonder what we wouldn't say. By the way, let me let, let you in on something. Um, Gospel Light Baptist Church, man, I had a great time with the preacher and uh, talked about the vision that he has and the dream that he has and the and the goals that he has. And, and, and if you think right now this is it, how can I put it? Uh, you haven't seen anything yet, baby. <laughs> Good. Man, you've had great days and you've seen great things and you've had great victories. But you know what? I believe with all of my heart, as long as we, as long as we hang on to the sword, good, the blessing is beyond us. Amen. Brother Randy at that book table last week in Cincinnati, Ohio, signed a Dr. Tommy Trammell's Bible. I thought to myself, I'm so glad I hung on to my sword. I'm closing with this on March 15th, 19. 15. The British Navy had attacked the Turks at the Dardanelles. There was a terrific naval barrage from guns on the shore. Three ships had been sunk, and finally at noon, the British Navy uh, withdrew, <laughs> never to take the point uh, of that place during the engagement again. Uh, what they didn't know was the Turks had only six, oh my, only 60 seconds of ammunition left. And at that moment, we're preparing to surrender. Had the British Navy been persistent and continued to press the battle, they would have taken the Dardanelles, split the enemy forces, closed the war years earlier, and saved millions of lives. Listen closely, Christian. You staying in the struggle and hanging on to your sword 60 seconds more could be the thing that brings you to the most considerable blessings and benefits of your entire spiritual sojourn. Good. The blessing beyond you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We have seen from one page in the Bible why I refuse to release my sword any time soon. The brethren behind me, folks are coming. The battle beside me the blessing beyond we stand to our feet our heads are bowed I don't think in a church like this in a meeting like this we have to strap a GPS on your Bible and program altar and get you to do what God would have you do
Lake on Saturday night was to fly from Detroit to Nashville. Got to my gate, and uh, as soon as I got to the gate, the ticket agent announced the flight was delayed, and they'd be leaving at 1.30 Sunday morning. I was flying to Nashville. Because of the time difference, I'd leave at 1.30, I'd get to Nashville about 1.30. But 2.30 Detroit time. And then I had about an hour, 45, 50 minutes to the motel. Then I was preached three times that Sunday, the big day, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And so I texted the preacher and told him my flight was delayed. The new arrival time. 1.30 Detroit time, we finally boarded and flew to Nashville. Got off the plane, and it was so late, or early, depends how you look at it, Brother Peterson, that I didn't think it mattered to her. It just didn't matter. So late. As I kind of took the time, and I got to the baggage pickup area, and when I did, when I got to my baggage pickup area, there was a Delta ticket agent that had my luggage off, off of a belt, and she was standing next to it, smiling. And I know, you visitors, I know you don't think this way, but I, I thought to myself, visitors from heaven don't think this way. I thought to myself, great, just great. Something happened with my luggage. When I got up to her, she said, uh, good morning, Dr. Hamlin. I said, yes, ma'am, it is morning. She said, I got your luggage for you. I said, is there a problem? She said, oh, no, no, I just... Wanted to be a blessing to you and wanted to get your luggage. Sorry that the flight was delayed. I said, well, I appreciate it. I said, ma'am, can, uh, can you refresh my memory where I met you? You called me by name. And she said, oh, she said, you, you, you won't remember. But she said, when I was a little girl, she said, you'd come every spring and preach a revival meeting in my home church when I was a little girl. We lived in Livonia, Michigan, and Several years ago now, we've, we've moved to Nashville. She said, every time there's a flight in from Detroit, I look for your luggage, and I take it off of the belt, because I just want to be a blessing to you. Well, I thought to myself, Brother Peterson, at 1.30 Nashville time, 2.30 Detroit time, Sunday morning, Glad I didn't drop my sword. Amen. I want to lift their hand and say tonight, preacher. Tonight, with the Lord's help, I'm going to hang on to my sword like I've never hung on to it before. Amen. Amen. All over. Amen. All over. Thank you, man. Put them down. I wonder who would say, I didn't realize it was that important. But I do now. And I want to know what it is to have that, that blessing. Hands are going up. Be on me. You lift your hand all over. All over. All over. I'm not being morbid. Did you ever notice when a great man of God goes to heaven and they have his homegoing celebration at Brother Peterson? I'm not, I'm not being morbid. But you ever notice how you how you see him in that castle? Think about one of my heroes, Dr. Don Green. You always find them. their hand and say tonight preacher I've got a greater grip I've got a greater grip and the Lord hands going up the Lord's being me and my helper I'm not going to let go of my sword anytime soon thank you Lord, for that. your 
you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you've never trusted Christ, oh, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He was buried and rose again from the dead that you might be saved. If you're here and you're lost, you ought to step out tonight. Let a kind person take an open Bible and lead you to Christ. You need to come right now. serving yesterday, that, that encouragement, that, that, that helpful message. But we're not going to do it if we don't hold on to the Word of God. We're, we're not going to we're not going to be pushing ourselves towards uh, a nation, towards a revival like he preached on Sunday night if we don't hold on to the Word of God. Right. Each service. Right. Great, great truth. All right. Uh, first, let me just mention Saturday, Saturday we have soul winning, yeah. visitation meeting, yeah. 11 o'clock, right here. Yeah. Soul winning, visitation meeting, here, 11 o'clock, 11 in the morning. Amen, we're not going out at 11 o'clock at night. Amen. Anyway, Saturday morning, yeah. men's prayer meeting, 6.30 p.m. here, 6.30 p.m. here, uh, men's prayer meeting. And then, if you would also uh, remember that we have... Uh, Oh, that teen activity coming up, teen picnic. Uh, it's going to be Saturday, October 28th, 3 to 6. Five, fifth grade through 12th grade is uh, uh, is what it's going to be geared for. There, we're going to bonfire. This going to be all at my house. Uh, bonfire, hay rides, s'mores games, good food. Amen. I know that, um, I, I think we may have, well, let me say this. I know First Baptist Church of Morley is going to be there. 
Uh, obviously, we're going to be there. Amen. And I believe uh, others may come as well. Green Meadow Bible Baptist, I believe, may come. And we're just going to have a good time with the young people. Amen. So I encourage you to have uh, your young people part of that coming up. And so uh, those are the announcements I'll make tonight. Looking forward to Sunday. Remember Sunday school. Amen. 10 a.m. Amen. Amen. Maybe we made a decision to go to Sunday school. Amen. Someone asked me recently. They said, uh, why don't you have discipleship? Discipleship. We do. Right. Every Sunday. Right. Really? I didn't see it in the bulletin. It's called Sunday school. Right. Right? We all need it. We need, yeah. we need that yeah. teaching of the Lord of God. All right. Looking forward to a great rest of this week. Let's take these truths. Let's take the decisions that we made. Let's hold on to the sword. Amen. Thank you for coming. Always oh, been a good week. It's been a good week. Amen. We're not done being Christians just because we're done with a revival. Amen. Right. Let's take these truths in the world. We're in a battle. He said it. He said it. Wait, what? Or right before a revival, in the midst of a revival, following a revival. You know what? We're going to be in a battle. It's right. going gonna to rage. It's going to rage in your home. It's going to rage in your heart. It's going to rage here at the house of God. And so let's let's go ahead and decide to hold on to it. Amen. Let's go ahead. And we're going to close in prayer. And uh, Brother uh, Long, sir, would you close us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. We ask you to help us to hang on to our sword, Lord. Amen. Do not drop it. Stay in the fight. Amen. I also pray and ask you to help us contend for the faith, Lord. Yes. Strengthen our pastor's hand. Help him reach his goals and his plans for this church. <coughs> Please be with us as we go out and go into this week come back on Saturday and Sunday. In Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Amen.